Hi everyone, I am Sam Robbins. Uh, I'm going to give a talk on the process of going from academic essays to blog articles. This is a talk I originally gave at the SOAS Summer School earlier this year, but due to some technical difficulties, uh, it wasn't recorded. So this is a um, re-recording of the presentation. It was originally given on a panel about public scholarship. So that's the theme here. So I want to talk about this process of translating across genres. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that in a second. But first, a little um, background to me. Uh, I graduated from SOAS with a degree in Chinese uh, modern and classical. I was very involved with the uh, Taiwan Studies Department at that time. I then went to uh, National Taiwan University here in Taiwan to do a master's degree in sociology, and I've recently graduated. And for about um, a little over a year now, I've been an editor at the magazine Taiwan Insight, which is the online magazine for the Taiwan Studies program at the University of Nottingham. Um, so throughout that process, I've written for Taiwan Insight, but also mostly uh, commissioned pieces, edited pieces, and really just got to read a lot of great articles and a lot of great content about Taiwan. So in that process of editing, I've kind of got a better sense of what I think works in an article and what I think doesn't work. So I'd like to share some advice about how to write for a publication like Taiwan Insight, or of course, for Taiwan Insight, if you're interested in writing for us. So I think the biggest mistake that often happens uh, when academics try to write for a broader audience is that they just make very surface level edits. And I call this a process of going from thus to therefore. So as an editor, I can tell pretty much right away when a piece I receive has been very lightly edited from a much longer piece of academic work. These pieces usually have a lack of awareness of reader. They're effectively writing for themselves or their academic peers. There's language that I don't think really is appropriate to that context. Uh, it's just a direct copy and miniature of a much longer piece, so it ends up reading like an extended abstract, or it just speaks to a point that I don't think works outside of a very arcane academic context. So what I like to think is much more useful and what I think I've read a lot of pieces that do really great is the process of translating. And I use this term translating to specify against dumbing down. It doesn't mean taking academic work and simplifying it you know, for the lay masses, but rather it's about taking a piece of work and making it work in another genre. And this idea of genre is very, cru uh, is very crucial. So it's a process of transformation, not simplification. Different genres demand different things. And also different audiences care about different things. And I use this concept of genre to refer to academic writing and blog writing because I think it's important to remember that valuable aspects of a piece of research can be highlighted in different genres. And there are things that blog articles allow you to do that academic essays actually don't. So again, it's a process of taking one piece of work and presenting it in a different way for a different group of people. Also, of course, blog articles generally have a larger audience than a piece of academic work. So not only is it a way to highlight pieces of your work that you might not otherwise have the chance to, it's also a chance to get more people to read it. I'm very certain that the pieces I've written for Taiwan Insight based on my thesis will be read many more times than my actual thesis. And that's great, you know, it's, I'm just glad that it's getting out there. So I think the first step of understanding how to translate across genres is to be able to recognize genres for what they are and think about the conventions they might have. So a lot of you listening are probably students or academics or have been in academia for a while. So you're very familiar with the genre of academic writing, but I think there can be a risk of being so familiar that you forget the rules that uh, are implicitly stated when we write in academia. So I wanna make them really explicit here and help us think about it as a genre. So when you're writing academically, you're writing for other academics in your field. Or if you're in a class, you're writing for a professor of that class. Now, why that's relevant is that usually means you're going to assume some type of disciplinary training and you're going to be able to use some certain disciplinary specific terms of art. Now, I'm a sociologist by training. So when I write uh, research or I write my thesis, it was for sociologists. And that was, you know, in my mind when I thought about what I could mention <clears throat> and what was relevant and what people knew. Academic writing also usually has a highly regulated structure. It's going to be an intro. There's going to be a literature review. There's going to be data, an argument and a conclusion. Now, especially when we talk about monographs or uh, longer <clears throat> research articles, they're implicitly, read, they're implicitly written not to be read in a consecutive order. Now, you'll see in a lot of monographs that kind of a central idea gets repeated in many chapters or in many times. And this isn't a bad thing. It's just taking into account how your readers might engage with a text, which I think is a really great thing to do. Also, these texts are written to be in a sustained dialogue with existing texts. <clears throat> 
Now, I've also, <coughs> sorry, I've already mentioned a little bit about assuming disciplinary training. What this allows us to do is we can assume that our readers have probably read certain texts and we can talk about those texts and think about how they relate to the text that you're writing. Now, another feature of academic writing is that there's generally an aversion towards speculation and personal reflection. I think especially in the social sciences, there's this idea of reproducibility. And I intentionally put this in, you know, quotation marks, this idea that anyone could write this piece or anyone could do this research. Therefore, you know, I'm not in the piece, it's objective. So that's how I generally think about academic writing as a genre. And it's not a criticism or a praise of it. I just think that's how it works. Blog articles, on the other hand, are a very different genre and they have a very different set of uh, concerns and constructions. That said, it's a much looser genre and it's highly dependent on the publication. So if you take one thing away from this speech today, it's that if you're writing, whoever you're writing for, try to learn about them as a publication. You know, read some pieces they've written, maybe contact the editor and learn about what they're interested in and how they work. But if I want to talk in general terms about blog articles, we can say they're written for a, a general audience. And that means that you assume uh, less prior knowledge. Shorter pieces are, are written to be read in a single sitting. So you don't have to constantly signpost or constantly return to a central point. It's narrative nonfiction. That means you're developing an account. There's a beginning, middle, and an end instead of an introduction and a conclusion. These pieces usually don't end where they started. There's a development throughout the piece. An argument is developed in that progress rather than stated and articulated throughout the piece. Blog articles are also a great place to engage with a perspective, a point of view, and really bring forward your personal insights. <clears throat> so now that we can talk about blog, uh, academic writing as a genre and we can talk about blog articles as a genre, how do we move across those two genres? Because I've seen some great examples of a piece that came from and uh, you know, a thesis that was then reworked into a really successful blog article. So I want to give nine translation tips for how to move that process. So the first tips are all about broader framing issues. And I think the most important part of this is audience shifts. So, uh, so the tip I would give you is to learn how to picture your imagined audience. Now, the most important question to ask yourself is who are you writing this piece for? So again, I said, if you're writing a piece for a class, you're writing it for that professor. If you're writing a piece for an academic journal, you're reading it for you're writing it for readers of that journal. That question is going to be different for public scholarship. And you need to think about who the reader is and why do they care and what do they already know. Also crucial is what do you want them to learn and what can you tell them? I really encourage people to think specifically about this and not to think abstractly about you know groups of readers or cohorts, but try to think of someone specifically when you're writing. Now, whenever I write something for Town Insight, I have the a few names of people I follow on Twitter that I know read my articles and I write for them and think, you know, would they like this piece? Would they know this? Would they care about this? Um, and I think you can do that too. And if you're not sure exactly who that person may be, you can ask your publication and say, who generally reads this? Who is the audience? Because different audiences things care about different things. Now, secondly, once we've done this broader shift of moving the audience, we really need to reframe the piece and why it's important and why it's new. I think we need to move from theoretical importance to empirically importance. Now, especially I think in the social sciences, we like to think that a concept or a piece of research is relevant because we can draw general, generally articulated principles from them that have a broader application, right? You know, when you're researching democracy in Taiwan, it can tell us something about East Asian democracies or new democracies or democracies broader. But I don't think blog articles have to be framed that way. Sometimes a great story is important in and of itself. So you should always ask why someone should care about this topic and exactly what's new in your piece, but how you answer that question can be very genre specific. Some things are empirically interesting, even if they are not theoretically important. Sometimes a story is good in and of itself. Sometimes there doesn't need to be a general principle that can be drawn from it. Now I'd like to give two examples of this. So the first um, example I would like to give is from my undergraduate thesis, which is something I turned into an article for Taiwan Insight. Now, if I had to sum up my undergraduate thesis in a single sentence, I would say that transitions in party politics and in media systems affect how and when safety might become a political issue and who can define what safety means. When I came to write this for Taiwan Insight, how I framed the piece and why it's important changed a lot, even though it was about the same story. So I have to, if I had to give a one-line summary of that article, I would say that the 1990s were a time of great demographic, a democratic progress in Taiwan, but also of deepening anxieties about crime and safety across the political spectrum. So both these quotes are referring to one piece of research, but written for very different contexts. Now, sometimes this translation doesn't actually have to be that big. So another piece of research I've been working on 
is about fun in the government zero community. So the academic framing of this is that social movements literature overlooks the political pot potentials of positive emotions such as fun. Now, I think this point actually worked relatively well for a broader audience. So when I came to write that for Taiwan Insight, my point was that fun can be a motivator of political action. But in both cases, you can see that exactly what's relevant, what's interesting, and what's new is framed in a different way. Now, building on this and broadening out a little bit, I think an important translation is also to move from writing for a specific discipline to writing to a region. Now, I've already mentioned that, you know, if you're writing for a paper or if you're writing for an article, <clears throat> you're usually writing for a specific audience. So, you know, I'm a sociologist by training. So when I write things, it's for sociology and why it tells us about sociological principles. But for Taiwan Insight, I'm writing about Taiwan or group or set of people in Taiwan. Now, this distinction, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's important to think about, you know, why are these people interesting regardless of the broader principles and uh, why this region is interesting. And that doesn't mean you have to abandon your training, but it's more crucial to think about what can your discipline teach us and why should non-specialists care? So another example I would give of this is a paper written by one of my classmates. So the essay was talking about mother-child relationships as a mechanism for the reproduction of social inequality in Taiwan. It's a very sociological point that, you know, was done very well, but I didn't think it worked for Taiwan Insight. So we, when we came to rework this piece for Taiwan Insight, the piece was about stigma faced by single mothers in Taiwan. Now, why this point is interesting is because of the mothers themselves, their stories and their life experiences. Same piece of research, but framed in different ways. Now, having said all this, I think it's really crucial that we can still work with theory and frame it in a different way. I would never suggest you have to abandon theory or that you have to dumb down anything you think might be too complex or too abstract. Most theoretical ideas can be useful when worked in a way, when presenting them in a way that doesn't assume prior knowledge about the concept. So for example, if you use an essay that builds on historical institutionalism, perhaps you write it for a general audience in a way that highlights the way that past experiences shape how a system works now. So again, I'm still using this theory and using this idea, but I'm not assuming any prior knowledge of historical institutionalism, and I'm not spe this specifically speaking to that canon. Now, another example, perhaps you're discussing the modernization theory of democratization. You can still write about that for a general audience, but it will become instead thinking about how and whether economic development tends to lead to democratization. So again, you don't have to abandon your discipline. You don't have to abandon theory, but you have to make it work in a new context. So the next uh, few points are about writing style and prose and narrative rather than overall framing. And the crucial thing here is moving from a whole to a part. So I'd really encourage you not to condense an entire thesis into 1,000 words. You have to be very length con uh, considerate in whatever context, right? If you're writing a 10,000 word thesis, you can't write 15,000 words. Similarly, if you're given 1,000 words for a blog article, you can't write 1,500 words. So with that in mind, you should never try to do too much. I often reach out to people and say, you know, this thesis, I saw your work, it's really interesting, can you write a piece for me? And I just get that whole thing condensed into 1,000 words, and it just reads like an abstract. What I think is much uh, a much more successful strategy is to take one chapter or the most interesting point of your thesis and write a piece on that. And the great thing about that is then you can stretch it out into two pieces or three pieces or more, right? I would much rather see one argument explained in full than three things explained poorly. Now, another way to think about this, or another example of this, is thinking about how much interview data or how many characters you can introduce. Now, I was recently asked whether I have a limit on the amount of characters I allow authors to introduce in an article. I don't, but I do think it's important to consider how many names and how many people I have to remember. So if you're dealing a lot with interview data, I don't want 1,000 words of just quotes of six different people because it's hard to, uh, it's hard to develop a consistent thread through that. So you have to be very considerate of the length you're given. Another aspect of this is if you're writing 1,000 words or 1,500 words, you can assume that a piece will be read in one sitting and every word counts a lot more. So I really encourage people to move away from signposting. Now, what I mean by signposting is in this essay, I will, or the next section will show, or my argument has three sections, or in conclusion, I have shown that. That's signposting. It's telling me where I'm gonna go as a reader. Because the readers are gonna engage with this text in a much more linear and direct way, I don't think it needs that. Similarly, a conclusion doesn't need to be a direct overview of the content. If a piece is five, it takes five minutes to read, I remember what I read five minutes ago. That doesn't mean 
you don't need any conclusion, but it can look very different. It can move the piece in a new direction. It can be forward looking. It can be reflective. I think with a shortened piece, you don't need to end where you started and you can move and progress the narrative in an interesting way to conclude the piece. I think of this as about showing, not telling. Don't say, I'm going to write, I'm going to tell you about this. Good writing guides its readers through the prose. Good writing tells me where we're going by going there. And good writing embeds conclusions throughout the text. So in every paragraph, I know what I'm meant to learn by the end of the paragraph. Now, a broader point we can draw from this is the idea of moving from argument to narrativity. And I really encourage people to embrace narrativity. And I've already talked about kind of empirical richness, but I really want to stress that empirical detail and story is important in and of itself. It doesn't need to serve a single point. Story have a writing or story that has a beginning that progresses, that tells a, a dynamic story is very good and successful in, in these blog article contexts. Uh, and it's a great point. It's a great way to express a point of view and tell an interesting story. So, you know, sometimes I've had people writing about, uh, you know, certain government reforms, but it's not, it doesn't have to be about the government reforms themselves and their effect, but just kind of that historical story and what did it look like before and what did it look like afterwards. So you don't need to have a central point and articulate that point. You can do something that progresses. This might be a bit more abstract, but I think this context of narrativity and kind of uh, writing in a way that isn't about an argument per se is really crucial if it can be done well. Now, another way to think about this is moving from objectivity to speculation. And I put objectivity in quotes because, you know, I don't personally think that objectivity is ever fully possible. And I also don't think that, you know, blind speculation is good, but I think that blog articles can be a really great way to, you know, express a point of view. So I talked a little bit about uh, academic writing as a genre. One thing that's really clear is that academic writing doesn't like forward-facing speculation. So, you know, we write about what's happened and what we know, not what we think might happen two years from now. Blog articles can be a really great place, but if you've got all this data and you really know this topic, to talk about what you think might happen or to express your point of view, or just generally put yourself into the piece in some ways. In a blog article context, a view from somewhere is always better than a view from nowhere. And you can weave in personal experiences in a way that doesn't underwrite your context or underwrite your argument or your uh, account, but rather builds on it and makes a piece more unique and interesting to readers. So finally, I think this is one of the more complex points, and it's something that I'm actually not that good at, and I'm still learning to do well. But it's this point of giving context where relevant. So again, if you have 1,000 words, you can't spend too much of it explaining key terms or giving all the historical context. You can only give context where relevant. So you have to learn how to explain a term in no more words than is necessary. At the same time, people won't follow an argument if they don't know all the moving pieces. So we do have to explain things, but do it shortly. So an example is that I write about the government zero uh, community in my thesis. Now, whenever I write about this in my thesis, you know, I've got pages about their history and what they stand for, and I could write a long piece about this. In 1,000 words, what you're going to get is something like government zero is a decentralized civic tech community that advocates transparency, open source technology, and civic participation. Uh, another example, you know, if you're writing about Li Donghui, you could write a whole biography of him. You could write a whole book about him. But on first mention, you should say something like Taiwan's first democratically elected president. It's simple, and it tells me what I need to know without giving me too much detail. Of course, exactly what is relevant will depend on the piece. So this is just something to keep in mind and think about. What do I need to say, and what can I, uh, what can I leave out? Now, I started this piece talking about writing Taiwan for a general audience. And I work at Taiwan Insight, and my background is Taiwan studies. So I'd like to give a little bit of advice specifically for writing uh, Taiwan and how to think about this. Now, the first point I would make is that it's the exactly how to write Taiwan or what's interesting about Taiwan is going to be very dependent on the publication. So you have to think about who you're writing for. So for example, Taiwan Insight is written for people who care about Taiwan, who are interested in Taiwan and already have some prior knowledge. Now, if you're writing for something which has a broader East Asian perspective or regional perspective, you're going to assume a little less knowledge. If you're writing for something that isn't interested in Taiwan at all, then of course you're going to assume even less background knowledge, and you have to think about why Taiwan is interesting. It's also really important that you're just generally following English language coverage of Taiwan, and you generally know what are the narratives, what's fresh, what's already been said. Of course, you don't need to read everything, but, you know, when you're writing about Taiwan in the English language, you're part of an English language conversation about Taiwan. That's true about academic pieces, but it's also true about the news and blog uh, articles. So support and learn from existing publications. 
Now, I mentioned this point earlier, but I think it's really important to think about whether you're writing about Taiwan, a group of people in Taiwan. Because sometimes people say to me, you know, I, I want to make Taiwan more visible. I care a lot about Taiwan. How do I get people to know about Taiwan? You know, that's a great goal, but sometimes it's just more important to tell stories of people in Taiwan. And, you know, for me, for example, Government Zero is interesting as an activist community um, in and of itself, not because it's in Taiwan. And I can tell a story about Government Zero that isn't a story about Taiwan. Now, of course, I have to talk about Taiwan to explain Government Zero, but the focus is on the community and these people. And I think once you frame it that way, not only is it a great way to get into the narrative, but it allows you not to have to explain everything about Taiwan. It, it avoids you having to get the cliches of, you know, a move likely to anger China or whatever. If it's about the people or if it's about a specific group, then how that story works or what is a Taiwan story can be uh, framed differently. Now, a final point I want to make, and I say this is a Taiwan specific point, but it's it's not. Of course, it's it's relevant for wherever you're writing about, but uh, I, I'm talking about Taiwan, so I'll put it in the Taiwan context. But when you're writing for a broader audience or in an academic context, I think it's really important to try to support local voices it, uh, wherever you can. And uh, in your blog article or in the piece, you know, try to find out what's been written in Taiwan about this, highlight those voices and engage with those voices. And if you have the skills to do it, translating is a really great way of doing public, public scholarship. There are a lot of great blogs here in Taiwan that do these type of articles and have published successful pieces that would get a broader audience if you public if you translate them into English. And it's also a good way to learn what makes a piece work. So this is something I personally try to do when I advocate. And I'm not saying don't write your own pieces or, uh, you know, don't get your research out there, but I'm saying you can do both and there are multiple ways to do public scholarship. Okay, um, so this is a broad summary of what I've talked about. I know I've briefly, I know I talked about before about against conclusions, but I think in the genre of PowerPoint presentation conclusions is still good. So recognize genres, consider your readership, reframe a topic and think about what's interesting about the topic and embrace narrativity. So that's everything I have today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, please don't hesitate to get in touch if you're interested about this process or talking about the PowerPoint. Or if you're interested in writing for Taiwan Insight, I'm very happy to talk about that. Um, please check out Taiwan Insight. I think we do a pretty good job of putting out interesting content on Taiwan. Uh, feel free to check out my Twitter. Uh, some of it's Taiwan related, some of it's not. But yeah, uh, it would be great to hear from people. And yeah, thank you for listening.